Y'all good? Everybody? Good morning. Welcome to the October 2019 open meeting of the Federal Communications Commission. Madam Secretary, could you please walk us through the agenda for the morning? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning to you and good morning, Commissioners. For today's meeting, you will hear six items for your consideration. First, you will consider an order on reconsideration that would ensure that carriers receiving high cost universal service support to deploy rural broadband networks are accountable to consumers taxpayers and the commission while providing flexibility for smaller carriers by making targeted modifications to the testing procedures that carriers must use to show that their networks perform at the commission's speed and latency standards. Second, you will consider a declaratory ruling that would clarify section 6F1 of the new and emerging technologies 911 Improvement Act of 2008 and ensure regulatory parity in 911 fees between VoIP services and traditional telecommunications services. Third, you will consider a notice of proposed rulemaking that would seek comment on whether the common antenna siting rules for FM and TV broadcaster applicants and licensees remain necessary given the current broadcasting marketplace. Fourth, you will consider a memorandum opinion and order that would grant the petition of Charter and find that Charter faces effective competition in providing cable services in certain franchise areas in Massachusetts and Hawaii. Fifth, you will consider a report and order that would amend tariffing rules to better align them with the reality of easy electronic access to tariff filings. Sixth, you will consider an order and six further notice of proposed rulemaking that would streamline rules and procedures to expedite the successful completion of the 800 megahertz band reconfiguration initiative, lower program costs and administrative burdens, and continue to alleviate interference to public safety licensees. This is your agenda for today. The personnel action listed seventh on the agenda in the commission's October 18th 2019 notice was adopted by the commission and deleted from today's agenda. The first item entitled Connect America Fund will be presented by the Wireline Competition Bureau and Chris Monteith, Chief of the Bureau, will give the introduction. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Ms. Monteith, the floor is yours. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. Happy Friday. The Wireline Competition Bureau is pleased to present for your consideration an order on reconsideration that, if adopted, would respond to petitions for reconsideration and applications for review of a 2018 Bureau-level order that adopted a uniform set of testing methodologies for all carriers receiving Connect America Fund support to use for speed and latency testing purposes. I'd like to thank the Bureau team for their hard work on this item, as well as our colleagues in the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau and the Offices of Engineering and Technology, Economics and Analytics, and General Counsel for their helpful input. Seated at the table from the Wireline Competition Bureau and the Telecommunications Access Policy Division are Sue McNeil, Special Counsel, Ryan Palmer, Division Chief, Suzanne Yellen, Assistant Division Chief, and Stephen Wang, Attorney Advisor. And from a, the Office of Economics and Analytics, Alec McDonnell. I would also like to specifically thank Alec and Kathy Zima of OEA for their extensive work on this item. Stephen will now present the item. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. Good morning. The Commission has invested significant universal service fund support for the deployment of broadband capable networks in high cost rural areas as part of the FCC's strategic goal of closing the digital divide. But only networks that can deliver broadband services capable of supporting key applications will allow Americans to fully realize the benefits of connectivity. That is why the Commission requires recipients of universal service supports in high cost areas to deploy broadband networks that meet specific minimum service standards. These standards protect taxpayers' investment and ensure that carriers receiving support deploy networks that deliver on the performance standards they promise to rural consumers. This order on reconsideration reviews the performance measures for Connect America Fund high-cost universal service support. 
established in 2018 by the Wireline Competition Bureau, the Wireless Telecommunications Bureau, and the Office of Engineering Technology to ensure that those standards strike the right balance between ensuring effective use of universal service funds and the flexibility providers need given the practicalities of network deployment in varied circumstances. If adopted, it would make targeted modifications to the performance measure requirements to ensure that carriers are accountable to taxpayers, consumers, and the commission, and are deploying networks that perform at the required levels, while allowing sufficient flexibility for carriers of any size to comply with the testing rules without unnecessary costs or burdens. We believe these changes will alleviate concerns expressed by carriers by increasing the time for carriers to meet certain deadlines and further minimizing the costs associated with compliance, yet still ensure that carriers meet their performance obligations. Specifically, the order on reconsideration would affirm the overall approach adopted in 2018 while making certain changes, including correlating the start of carriers' network performance testing to align with the timing of their specific deployment obligations, providing a pre-testing period so that carriers can begin testing and addressing issues without any withholding of support before the formal testing period begins, allowing greater flexibility for carriers to choose the endpoints for testing their network's performance, and modifying the rules regarding withholding of support for non-compliance with the speed and latency requirements by providing credit where carriers can demonstrate compliance for some portion of the support term. The Bureau recommends adoption of this order on reconsideration and requests editorial privileges extending only to technical and conforming edits. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wang, for your presentation. We'll now turn to comments from the bench, beginning with Commissioner O'Reilly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The item before us provides some needed flexibility on timing and other testing components while reaffirming the Commission's overall goal of ensuring sufficient quality broadband from one of our consumer paid subsidy programs. It has my support. At the same time, I was dismayed by a certain narrative put forth not by the chairman or his good team or people within the agency, but folks on the outside that the groups seeking some relief and clarification within our broadband testing regime were attempting to harm rural America and subject to inferior broadband service. I've worked with the petitioner groups for many years, and while Lord knows we've had many agreements and disagreements on various issues, this type of messaging was unfair and unfounded. These are reputable organizations representing hardworking companies seeking to bring broadband service to some of the hardest to serve regions of our nation. I would urge those casting accusations to take their rhetoric down a notch or two before engaging in further criticism of some of the dedicated people trying to bring digital access to their neighbors, friends, and communities. I thank the chair. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Carr. Thanks. When Americans spend their hard-earned dollars on fast internet connections, they expect to get what they're paying for, and rightly so. They expect the speeds they've been promised so their kids can do homework at night. They expect the quality they've been promised so they can run their home business. And they expect the responsiveness they've been promised so their families can connect over a video chat. Their expectations should be highest when the internet infrastructure that carriers build to their homes are constructed with universal service dollars. After all, consumers contribute billions of dollars each year to support these infrastructure builds. And carriers have committed to meeting performance benchmarks. Yet for decades, while commission after commission has allocated these billions of dollars worth of funds, the agency has never required or held carriers accountable to these types of specific performance requirements. And that's a shame, because as I visit rural communities in this job, I hear from Americans that often express doubt that they're getting what they've paid for. With this order today, the full commission votes for the first time on these uniform performance metrics and requirements. In doing so, we also respect the privacy of homeowners by clarifying that carriers need not put white box monitoring devices inside a customer's home. After all, from my time on the road, I doubt it would go uniformly well if an official knocked on a door and told the homeowner that the government wanted to install a device to monitor their internet usage. So today's decision now recognizes that carriers can meet their obligations without that type of intrusive measure. I'm also glad that we reject requests that we would eliminate performance tests or limit them to only a portion 
of the network. I understand carriers aren't directly in control of intermediate networks, but I also know these carriers have promised the Commission that they'd offer a particular level of service, and more importantly, they promised their customers a level of service. So they need to use their funding wisely to ensure that they have sufficient transport to get their customers the connections they need. I'm proud this item will help ensure that Americans get what they pay for, and I want to thank the Wireline Bureau for its hard work on this item. It has my support. Thanks. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Rosenworcel. Providing broadband to the most remote and rural areas of this country is not for the faint of heart. Consumers and businesses can be spread few and far between, terrain can be rough, and the deployment season can be brutally short. The economics are hard, and the business case is not always easy. But it is still a fact that we are stronger when we are connected to one another. So over the last decade, the FCC set out to modernize its universal service program to assist with the effort to connect all. And the agency has taken steps to support a mix of phone and broadband services in rural communities across the country. As a result, the FCC now commits over $4.5 billion a year to broadband deployment efforts in these areas. It is by far and away the largest of the agency's universal service efforts. That's why today's decision is so important. Going forward, carriers that accept high-cost universal service support to provide broadband will be required to test their networks to ensure that they actually offer the service they have committed to offer. This is about accountability. It's important. The FCC must make sure there are measures in place to demonstrate that universal service funding is being used to extend the reach of high-speed service to all. In other words, we have promises to keep. We also still have work to do. Two years ago, Representative Frank Pallone called attention to the fact that the FCC's own Inspector General stated that the agency does not have the dedicated resources it needs to police the Universal Service High Cost Program. That's a problem. And just one week ago, the Inspector General reminded us that this program does not comply with the Improper Payments Elimination and Recovery Improvement Act. We need to address these problems, stat. We need confidence in this program. We need to ensure it truly delivers. Just last week, I joined Senator Joe Manchin in West Virginia. We crisscrossed the state in all of its fall glory. The towns we stopped in were small, all proud of their history, and all grappling with their future. Everyone we met expressed concern about how reliable broadband had not yet reached their homes and businesses in the community. They spoke of the connections they were not able to forge, the economic opportunities that had been lost, and the students who struggled with the homework gap. Their frustrations were real. Many of them were also aggrieved that this agency's maps suggest they have service when they know on the ground, at home, and in their businesses, they simply do not. This trip was a reminder that we have big broadband challenges in this country. We have work to do. But back to the here and now. This decision is a modest step forward. It brings a new level of accountability to our funding for the high-cost universal service system, so it has my support. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Starks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> As I have said before, affordable broadband is a necessity for all Americans. And the broadband deployment catalyzed by the Connect America Fund uh, is a crucial step towards alleviating Internet inequality. It will help empower those living on the outskirts of today's digital society to share in the benefits of telemedicine and distance learning, among others. But deployment is only half the battle. If the performance of these networks fails to reach even minimum standards of speed and latency, then the people that they serve will be unable to fully realize the benefits of connectivity. Today's order improves our ability to hold carriers to account as they deliver on the promise of broadband. It helps safeguard precious universal, universal service dollars, and it offers needed clarity to cap participants on the requirements that they face to prove that they have met their obligations. The addition of pre-testing periods to our regime affords both carriers and the Commission time to evaluate how deployments are performing, and I'm glad to see that the Commission has mandated public access to the pre-testing data generated by the carriers. I look forward to seeing those numbers. 
And my thanks, of course, uh, to the staff for your hard work and in particular the commitment to getting all Americans connected to broadband. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Commissioner. To help achieve the FCC's number one priority, closing the digital divide, we provide billions of dollars each year in high-cost universal service support to carriers to deploy modern, high-speed broadband networks to unserved Americans living in rural areas. These networks are essential to bringing digital opportunity to every American. I've seen firsthand the impact of these universal service-funded rural networks across the country. Just a few weeks ago, in Mandan, North Dakota, I met with a consumer getting a fiber broadband connection for the first time. I saw the sense of wonder he had as we talked about how he and his family would use this new outlet to the world. And I met two of his neighbors who had recently been connected. One was a software engineer who could finally work more regularly from home, letting him spend more time with his family. And another had started a successful baby clothing business in her home because she had that vital broadband connection. But Americans like these only get the full benefits of connectivity if the carriers receiving universal service support follow through, if they actually deliver the speed and responsiveness that they committed to provide. Most such carriers must build out their networks to specific numbers of homes and businesses, but that's only half of the equation. Deploying a broadband network means providing the network speed and latency that consumers and the commission expect to ensure that rural Americans are not relegated to a second-class service. Now, President Reagan was fond of the old Russian proverb, trust but verify, and today's order is about the verify part of the equation. So specifically, we must verify that carriers are not only building the infrastructure, but also supplying the service quality required by our rules. The testing methodologies we adopt today are rigorous because we must ensure that both American taxpayers, who of course contribute to the Universal Service Fund, and rural consumers are getting their money's worth. But these methodologies are also workable for all carriers. We recognize that carriers of different sizes and technical and financial capabilities have different needs. And so today we decide to closely review the existing testing methodologies and make targeted changes that will provide flexibility and eliminate unnecessary burdens on carriers while still ensuring that carriers are accountable to consumers, to taxpayers, and of course the commission. Whether there is a two-way video chat between a doctor and her patient, a student collaborating with classmates in real time on a school project, a farmer using precision agriculture to increase the yield of his farm, or just a family streaming their favorite movies and television, rural Americans must have a broadband connection that will consistently deliver the promise that modern applications offer and require. And today's order will help ensure that that's the case. For the fantastic work on this order, I too would like to thank the staff of the Wireline Competition Bureau, the Office of Economics and Analytics, the Office of General Counsel, and the Office of Engineering and Technology. And with that, we'll proceed to a vote on the item. Commissioner O'Reilly? Aye. Commissioner Carr? Approve. Commissioner Rosenworcel? Approve. Commissioner Starks? Approve. Now the chair votes to approve as well. The item is adopted with editorial privileges granted as requested. Thanks for the work. Uh, Madam Secretary, can you take us to item number two on today's agenda? Mr. Chairman and Commissioners, the next item will also be presented by the Wireline Competition Bureau and is entitled Bell South's Petition for Declaratory Ruling Regarding the Commission's Definition of Interconnected VoIP in 47 CFR Section 9.3 and the Prohibition on State Imposition of 911 Charges on VoIP Customers in 47 USC 615A1F1. Once again, Chris Monteith, Chief of the Bureau, will give the introduction. Thank you, Madam Secretary. These titles just trip off the tongue, don't they? Just, yeah, <laughs> uh, Ms. Monteith, the floor is again yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning. The Wireline Competition Bureau is pleased to present for your consideration a declaratory ruling that resolves a controversy regarding 911 fees that threaten to frustrate con congressional intent and the Commission's goal of facilitating the transition to more advanced IP-based services that benefit American consumers and businesses. I would like to thank the Bureau team for their hard work on this item, as well as our colleagues in the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau and the Offices of Engineering and Technology, Economics and Analytics, and General Counsel for their helpful input. Seated at the table from the Wireline Competition Bureau and the Competition Policy Division are Terry Natoli, Associate Bureau Chief, 
Pam Arluck, Division Chief, Michelle levy Burlove, Special Counsel, and Jesse Goodwin, Attorney Advisor. Jesse will present the item. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. In the nearly 15 years since the Commission imposed 911 emergency service obligations on voice over internet protocol or VoIP services, VoIP services have proliferated to become the predominant type of fixed voice service used by consumers today. Following that first critical Commission step to advance the goals of public safety in the advent of the IP transition, Congress and the Commission have taken additional steps to ensure regulatory parity between traditional telecommunication services and VoIP services with respect to 911 service rights and obligations. The item before you responds to a primary jurisdiction referral from the U.S. District Court for the Northern District of Alabama arising from pending litigation between Bell South and certain Alabama 911 districts regarding the appropriate 911 fees to assess on certain voice service subscribers. Through this declaratory ruling, the Commission would take another important step in ensuring regulatory parity between VoIP services and traditional telecommunication services with respect to 911. And in so doing, it would resolve a controversy that threatens the Commission's goal of facilitating the IP transition by deterring consumers from switching from legacy VoIP services to more advanced IP-based voice services. This declaratory ruling would first clarify that Section 6F1 of the new and emerging, emerging Technologies 911 Improvement Act of 2008, or the Net 911 Act, prohibits state, local, and tribal 911 entities from discriminating against subscribers of VoIP services by imposing on and collecting from a, a class of, of subscribers to VoIP services a higher total 911 fee than imposed on and collected from the same class of subscribers to telecommunication services having the same outbound 911 calling capability. Next, the declaratory ruling would provide examples of discriminatory 911 fee structures that, would, that could be applied in a manner that violates the Net 911 Act. Finally, the declaratory ruling would provide important guidance to the referring Alabama District Court and other state courts where similar litigation is pending concerning the appropriate 911 fees to be assessed on subscribers to VoIP services. The Bureau recommends adoption of this declaratory ruling and requests editorial privileges extending only to technical and conforming edits. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Goodwin, for that presentation. We'll now turn to comments from the bench, beginning with Commissioner O'Reilly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It is highly objectionable that some states have attempted to impose discriminatory 911 fees on certain communication services. The item before us is a completely reasonable and proper response to the narrow scope of the issues presented. Well, I certainly support it and thank Chairman Pai for bringing it forward Alabama's activity highlights at least two larger issues. First, there seems to be no apparent moral or ethical barrier to prevent some states, territories, and localities from abusing, misappropriating, manipulating, and or downright stealing consumer paid 911 fees. Many of us on this dais, particularly Chairman Pai and Commissioner Rosenworcel, have actively worked to eliminate the diversionary practices by certain dirty route and ta taxing jurisdictions with some degree of success. The imposition of discriminatory taxes, as highlighted by this case, is simply another example of 911 fee theft and further reinforces the need for the Commission to play a far greater role in eliminating such egregious behavior and practices. Where we have authority, we must act aggressively, and where we don't, we shouldn't be afraid to seek new authority from the Congress. Second, and from a broader perspective, this item is reflective of the need to acknowledge market realities and should be part of a regulatory norm. VoIP should be classified as an interstate information service. Doing so firmly establishes its proper treatment consistent with our governing statute and precedent, as recently confirmed by the Eighth Circuit and left undisturbed by the Supreme Court. That doesn't mean it would be a completely regulatory free zone because various obligations and burdens such as 911 and USF contributions and access requirements would still apply. Beyond meeting the statutory definitions, logical consistency demands it since we classify fixed broadband, mobile broadband, and IP video services as information services and it strains credibility that we don't do the same for VoIP. Previous commissions danced around this taking the simple step 
causing significant hardships and headaches for providers and others. Does the fact that an IP packet contain two-way voice make it intrinsically different from a video or data packet? Of course not. Ending some of the shenanigans and gamesmanship we have seen in some states attempting to regulate IP voice service is necessary and appropriate and can be done without undermining our ability to protect consumers as needed. And I thank the Chair. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Carr. <coughs> Thanks. Americans that use VoIP shouldn't pay more for their 911 service. And we should be encouraging consumers to use new and advanced services, not making it more difficult. So I'm glad that the Commission is issuing this decision today that resolves uh, this controversy. And thank you very much to, to the staff for your support and work on it. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Rosenworth. In this decision, we address a primary jurisdiction referral from a federal court in Alabama seeking guidance on the meaning of the new and emerging technologies 911 Improvement Act of 2008. It's a law with which I have more than a passing amount of familiarity because you can head upstairs and you'll find a signed copy on my office wall. That's because when I had the privilege of serving as counsel on Capitol Hill, this was one of the pieces of legislation I was charged with shepherding through the United States Senate. And today, the Federal Communications Commission has been asked to provide direction on the meaning of this law's so-called fee parity provision. This provision was designed to create an upper bound so that 911 fees applicable to IP-enabled voice services would be comparable to those fees that are placed on traditional telephony. In response, today this agency determines that outbound 911 calling capability or capacity is the key criterion for purposes of this comparison. I approve because this is a fair interpretation of what the law requires. It is, however, a close call. That's because our interpretation today supersedes some language from a 2005 FCC decision that invited 911 authorities to explore other means of collecting 911 fee assessments when it comes to IP-enabled voice services, just as state authorities in Alabama had done. But let's get real. While this decision tinkers around the edges, we have a real challenge before us to make sure that 911 is fully funded and functional nationwide. And we can start with ending 911 fee diversion. This is an abusive practice, and I appreciate that Commissioner O'Reilly has joined me in efforts to help bring it to an end. And as we look ahead, I know we will not realize the potential of next generation 911 without getting creative. Last year, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the National Telecommunications and Information Administration estimated the cost of next generation 911 deployment nationwide to be between $9.5 and $12.7 billion. The way I see it, this is worth every penny because there is no more essential infrastructure for our day-to-day -day safety. To this end, I am glad that in the Lift America Act, we recognize this fact, and I believe that funding for next generation 911 must be a core feature of any infrastructure package Washington takes up in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Starks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The ability to call 911 is a vital service that both, vo both VoIP and traditional telecommunication services must provide to their customers. As policymakers, we must understand that there is a lot of complexity underlying the 911 system so that it works for everyone, everywhere, every time. But when a customer calls 911, she doesn't care how much that cost will uh, that call work will cost her, or whether uh, her call will be transmitted over the internet or over traditional phone lines. She shouldn't have to care. She needs help. So I support today's ruling because Congress, when it passed the Net 911 Act in 2008, wanted to prevent the cost of calling 911 from discouraging customers from switching to new VoIP technology. Under that statute, 911 fees or charges to VoIP subscribers cannot exceed those for a traditional telecommunication service subscriber. There is nothing inherent in VoIP technology that would justify a disparity in the 911 fee charged to VoIP subscribers. And features of VoIP service may impact a customer's capacity to make simultaneous outbound calls to 911, but two customers with the same 911 calling capacity should pay the same in those total fees. In Alabama before 2012, different 911 fees for VoIP 
and TDM could have impacted business decisions about whether to invest in new technology or to stay with old technology with capped fees. And that's exactly what Congress wanted us to avoid. The ability to call 911 is not a bargaining chip. It is a public service that saves lives, and one call should not cost more than another. Today, we do protect consumers' choice to adopt new technology in times of transitioning infrastructure. We do not want to disincentivize customers from upgrading to new technology by disproportionately charging for access to public services. Nobody wants to have to call 911, but consumers must be able to reach it no matter what technology they use. Thank you to the Bureau for your hard work. Thank you, uh, Commissioner. In his 1947 article, Some Reflections on the Reading of Statutes, former U.S. Supreme Court Justice Felix Frankfurter explained that a true problem of statutory construction is only present where, and I quote, there is a fair contest between two readings. The proceeding before us presents no such contest. In response to a referral from a federal district court in Alabama, we interpret a provision of the Net 911 Act of 2008. And that provision barred states and localities from imposing a 911 fee or charge on VoIP service subscribers <coughs> that exceeds the amount of any such fee or charge applicable to the same class of subscribers to telecommunications services. As we have heard, some counties and cities in Alabama have argued that this provision allows them to impose a higher total amount of 911 fees on a business subscriber to VoIP service than on a business subscriber to traditional telephone service, so long as the nominal per unit rate for the 911 charge is the same, and even if the unit is different for VoIP service than it is for traditional telephone service. So take, for example, a charge of $1 per telephone number for the VoIP customer and $1 per line for the telephone service customer. Because businesses typically buy many more telephone numbers for internal communications among employees than they do for outbound calling lines, in this case, the VoIP customer would likely pay substantially more in 911 fees than the telephone service customer if they both have the same outbound 911 calling capability. Well, we find that the Net 911 Act does not allow such disparate treatment. The same class of subscribers, to borrow from the statute, cannot be forced to pay more in total 911 charges for VoIP services than for comparable non-VoIP services. This is the only plausible reading of the law. No other interpretation raises a fair contest, as Justice Frankfurter contemplated that phrase. Our interpretation is consistent with the statutory text and the ordinary meaning of the word amount as the total quantity of something or the aggregate. For those fans of legislative history, it's also consistent with the legislative intent behind the 911 Act, which was to level the playing field between VoIP and traditional telecommunications services when it comes to 911 rights and obligations. And it is also consistent with both Congress's and the FCC's goal of facilitating the transition to next generation IP-based networks and services. Indeed, a contrary interpretation, that is, allowing higher aggregate 911 charges for VoIP services, would both discriminate against VoIP customers and discourage consumers and businesses from switching from legacy voice services to modern VoIP services. To assist the referring court and other courts overseeing similar litigation around the country, we also provide examples of discriminatory 911 fee structures that could violate the Net 911 Act. And these include setting caps on the maximum number of 911 fees that may be imposed on a business subscriber to, to traditional telephone service while providing no such cap for business subscribers to VoIP services. A further outstanding work on today's declaratory ruling, I too would like to thank our colleagues at the Commission, namely from the Wireline Competition Bureau, the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau, the Office of General Counsel, the Office of Engineering and uh, Engineering and Analytics, Economics and Analytics, and the Office of Engineering and Technology. This item has my full support. And with that, we'll move to a vote on the item. Commissioner O'Reilly? Aye. Commissioner Carr? Approve. Commissioner Rosenworthel? Approve. Uh, Commissioner Starks? Approve. The uh, chair votes to approve as well. The item is adopted, and editorial privileges are extended as requested. Uh, thank you for the work. Madam Secretary, could you take us to item number three on today's agenda? Mr. Chairman and Commissioners, the third item on your agenda will be presented by the Media Bureau and is entitled Use of Common Antenna Site, Modernization of Media Regulation Initiative. Michelle Carey, Chief of the Bureau, will give the introduction. 
Thank you, Madam Secretary. And uh, Ms. Carey, whenever you and your folks are ready, the floor is yours. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. Good morning. Today, the Media Bureau presents a notice of proposed rulemaking that launches the 17th proceeding of the Commission's Modernization of Media Regulation Initiative. This item invites comment on whether we should eliminate or revise our requirements regarding access to FM and television broadcast antenna sites. Sitting with me at the table are Martha Heller and John Cobb from the Policy Division. John will present the item. Mr. Chairman and Commissioners, we are pleased to present this notice of proposed rulemaking that seeks to modernize the Commission's rules regarding access to FM and TV broadcast antenna sites. The NPRM invites comment on whether the Commission should eliminate or revise sections 73.239 and 73.635 of our rules, which prohibit the grant or renewal of a license for an FM or TV station if the applicant or licensee controls an antenna site that is peculiarly suitable for broadcasting in the area and does not make the site available for use by other similar licensees. The earliest FCC rules on record regarding the use of common antenna sites date from 1945, when the FM and TV broadcast industries were still in their infancy, broadcast infrastructure was sparse, and the Commission had implemented a moratorium on broadcast construction permits to conserve material and equipment for World War II. The broadcast marketplace has evolved substantially in the intervening 74 years. The dramatic increase in the number of FM radio and TV stations since 1945 has contributed to a corresponding increase in the number of antenna sites suitable for broadcasting. While some communications towers today are owned and operated by FM and TV broadcasters, the vast majority appear to be owned by non-broadcast entities including companies specializing in tower leasing. Additionally, there is, to our knowledge, no case where either of, these rule, either of the rules teed up in this NPRM was successfully invoked to withhold the grant of a license or license renewal application. Thus, the NPRM invites comment on whether we should eliminate or revise these requirements in light of the significant changes in the broadcast industry since they were first adopted nearly 75 years ago. Specifically, the item seeks comment on whether these rules remain necessary to promote broadcast competition and ensure an adequate variety of FM and TV broadcast sources, given the current state of the broadcasting marketplace and the abundance of non-broadcast owned tower sites. The NPRM also seeks comment on whether requests for the use of particular antenna sites under these rules are even made in today's broadcast marketplace. The Media Bureau recommends that the Commission adopt the Notice of Proposed Rulemaking and request editorial privileges to make any necessary technical or conforming edits. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Cobb, for that presentation, which I understand is your first one yes, at a Commission meeting. Congratulations and well done. Uh, with that, we'll turn to comments from the bench, beginning with Commissioner Riley. I thank the Chair. I'm going to submit my statement for the record. I want to thank the Chairman for his commitment to media modernization and the 17 items we brought forward and many more that will come. Um, and I look forward to reading the riveting record on this proceeding. <laughs> I thank the Chair. World War II remains over is the you know, bottom line. Uh, Commissioner Carter. Thanks. I know a lot of people thought my 35-minute speech in L.A. this week was the longest I would give. I'm going to try to outdo that on my statement oh my here. God. Uh, just kidding, of course. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much for the work on the item. It has my support. Thanks. Whew, thank goodness. Uh, Commissioner <laughs> Rosa Russell, thank you. Yeah. Uh, my colleague, Commissioner O'Reilly, may be expecting something riveting. I would say my standards for riveting are slightly different. But in any event, thank you to the Bureau for your work on this. It has my full support. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Starks. Yes, uh, same from me. Congratulations on the, uh, the hard work and looking forward uh, to approving the item. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. And I, too, will join my colleagues in refraining from an oral statement, although I'll have one for the record. I'd simply like to thank the staff from across uh, the Media Bureau and the Office of General Counsel for putting together this item, and in particular, uh, Michelle Carey, John Cobb, Martha Heller, who are arrayed before us, as well as Paul Jackson and Kim Matthews, and from the Office of General Counsel, Susan Aaron, David Consul, and Bill Richardson. Uh, thanks for the legwork. I uh, look forward to the record to come. With that, we'll proceed to a vote on the item. Commissioner O'Reilly? Aye. Commissioner Carr? Approve. Commissioner Rosenworcel? Approve. Commissioner Starks? Approve. And the chair votes to approve as well. Mm -hmm. Easy. All right, thanks so much for the work. Uh, Madam Secretary, can you take us to the next item on today's agenda? Mr. Chairman and Commissioners, the fourth item is entitled Petition for Determination of Effective Competition in 32 Massachusetts Communities and Kauai, Hawaii. 
The item will be presented by the Media Bureau, and once again, Michelle Carey, Chief of the Bureau, will give the introduction. All right, that Ms. Carey, the floor is again yours. Thank you. As you just heard, the Media Bureau presents a memorandum opinion and order that grants a competition, effective competition petition filed by Charter Communications. And sitting with me at the table are Brendan Murray, Steve Brokhart, and Joe Price of the Policy Division. Joe will present the item. Mr. Chairman and Commissioners, I am pleased to present this memorandum opinion and order granting Charter's effective competition petition. The Communications Act allows local franchising authorities to regulate the rates for the basic service tier and equipment if cable systems are not subject to effective competition. Given the statutory definition of effective competition and the state of the video marketplace, almost all cable systems in the United States are presumed to be subject to effective competition. However, there are certain cable systems in Hawaii and Massachusetts that are not. Charter's petition seeks a finding that AT&T's DirecTV Now video programming service, a streaming service recently rebranded as AT&T TV Now, provides effective competition to its cable systems in Kauai, Hawaii, and 32 communities in Massachusetts. The order finds that the DirecTV Now streaming service meets the elements of the effective competition test under the so-called LEC test, as defined by the Communications Act, for four reasons. First. DirecTV Now is provided by a LEC affiliate in the franchise areas because DirecTV is affiliated with a local exchange carrier, AT&T. Second, the streaming service is offered in the franchise areas because AT&T can physically deliver the service to subscribers. Third, DirecTV is offered directly to subscribers rather than through a third party because the relationship AT&T has with DirecTV Now customers. AT&T itself markets and bills <coughs> for the service and customers pay AT&T directly for the service. And fourth, pursuant to our <coughs> rules, the video programming services are comparable to the video programming services that Charter provides in the franchise areas because the service consists of at least 12 channels, including both broadcast and non-broadcast channels. The video marketplace is undergoing dramatic change with the rise of over-the-top services, and today's item appropriately recognizes that streaming services are increasingly providing competition to traditional market players. The Media Bureau recommends that the Commission adopt the Memorandum Opinion and Order and request editorial privileges to make any necessary technical or conforming edits. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Price, for that uh, presentation. We'll now turn to Commissioner O'Reilly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It may come as no surprise that I strongly support this order, which addresses some of the areas that remain after last Commission on a bipartisan basis changed the presumption for the effective competition test. This item rightfully acknowledges that over-the-top video services can and do compete directly with traditional multi-channel video programming distributors. Consistent with the statutory test, cable subscribers in the affected communities have access to broadband and, as a result, the very real ability to choose between video providers with quality content, thus eliminating the need for rate regulation of the basic tier by every applicable local franchise authority. And our determination here does not in any way subsume OTT services within the broken Title VI regime. I must admit that I'm slightly surprised at the pushback we've received for rooting out some of the last vestiges of rate regulation when the statute and the record clearly demonstrate effective competition through the LEC prong. It proves once again that the desire by some to regulate and over-regulate never subsides regardless of the facts. I thank the Chair. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Carr. Thanks. Today's decision is a straightforward case of statutory interpretation. In Section 623 of the Communications Act, Congress determined that a cable system is subject to effective competition if a local exchange carrier or its affiliate offers comparable video programming services directly to subscribers by any means. That test is plainly met in this case. DirecTV now is provided by an affiliate of a LEC. This OTT streaming service meets both prongs of the FCC's comparability test, and it's offered directly to subscribers in the relevant franchise areas over existing broadband facilities. While some argue that the statutory test isn't satisfied because DirecTV may not provide services via AT&T's facilities, the LEC, or because AT&T doesn't operate LEC facilities in the particular franchise areas, Congress imposed no such requirements in the statute, and it's certainly not our job to read those into the text. Indeed, the FCC determined nearly 20 years ago 
that a competitor need not provide video service over Alex facilities to meet the statutory test. Rather, the text is clear that competing video service providers can offer their service by any means. In addition to the statutory analysis, today's decision also makes sense in light of the vibrant market for video services that Americans now enjoy. In addition to DirecTV Now, consumers have access to online live TV streaming services such as Sling, Hulu, YouTube, and PlayStation View, not to mention an ever-growing array of on-demand video services and content sharing platforms. Not to be left behind, established video providers are finding innovative ways to bring their content to consumers. For instance, Dish and Encompass recently announced a partnership whereby network providers will offer customers Dish TV online video content and DVR equipment. And we're seeing even more competition emerging for new 5G in-home offerings, including one provider that's offering a free trial of YouTube TV with its 5G home internet plan. So I'm glad that today's decision also reflects the realities of the modern media marketplace. I want to thank the Media Bureau for its work on the item. It has my support. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Commissioner Rosenworcel. Take a look at the very first line of the Cable Television Consumer Protection and Competition Act of 1992, and you'll find that Congress was very clear about what it was doing when it enacted the law. The goal was simple. It was, and I'm quoting, to provide increased consumer protection and to promote increased competition in the cable television and related markets. To ensure this was the case, Congress laid out in detail how this agency, among others, would work to help ensure that competition thrives and consumers enjoy lower prices. After all, that's what you'd expect when there is greater competition, consumer bills that go down instead of up. Of course, this law is now more than a quarter of a century old, as are its guidelines for measuring effective competition. And I think it's fair to acknowledge that neither the authors of this law, nor those who offered nearly unanimous support for it in Congress, nor even the commissioners who sat here before us could have imagined the very different realities of today's media marketplace. The way we watch has changed. The days of huddling around a single set, basking in the glow of a favorite program on a system with only a handful of linear challenges, cha only a handful of linear channels has now gone away. Must-see TV now means many devices and an array of viewing opportunities headed into homes through a mix of antenna, cables, and wireless technology. Channels and content are available when we want to watch, where we want to watch, and what, on whatever screen we have handy. But even as our viewing choices have multiplied and the marketplace has changed, I think under the law, the interests of consumers still need to come first. Congress, of course, made this abundantly clear. Their intent was to increase competition to improve consumer protection and lower prices. To this end, in the law, Congress set up a statutory test for the presence of what it considered effective competition. And here, we have a petition from a cable company that asks us to find that a video streaming service offered by a local exchange carrier meets the criteria for effective competition. With such a finding, authorities in two states will lose authority to oversee the rates for basic cable service tier as it's charged to consumers. That's because the underlying assumption is that competition would constrain rates. So this petition asked the agency to consider for the first time how a specific type of streaming service should fit within the confines of the Cable Television Consumer Protection and Competition Act of 1992. So while I acknowledge that a narrow legal reading of the law suggests that the petition before us should be granted, I think the analysis from this agency is woefully deficient. If protecting consumers is truly our top priority, this agency should include in its decision an assessment of the likelihood of price increases in the states where the agency is concluding competition is adequate to constrain prices. But you can comb through the pages of this decision and you will not find one. And when my office asked that our economists provide such an assessment, we were refused. So let me detail here what the consequences are for consumers. Where this agency is overriding state authority to regulate what is known as the basic cable service tier, based on the record in this proceeding, consumers in these states affected by this proceeding 
can expect that rates for the basic cable service tier will double. That means they are facing bill increases of 50%. On top of that, the very streaming service that this decision relies on to demonstrate the presence of competition just last week announced price increases of 10 to $15 for its basic service. In short, it sure looks like rates are going to go up. Now, if you ask me, this is not the kind of competition that protects consumers. To the extent that the relief requested in this petition before us fits within the law, then the law, frankly, is only showing its age. I acknowledge the statutory construction in this case may require the result in this decision. But because our analysis fails to provide an honest assessment of the likelihood of price increases for consumers, I concur. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Starks. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, on the narrow issue before us, quote, Charter's petition for determination of effective competition in 32 Massachusetts communities and Kauai, Hawaii. I find that the reading of this order to be a reasonable one uh, of the LEC test, and so I must concur in the order. Nevertheless, I do foresee harm to vulnerable customers uh, and consumers from the action we take today. And so in that narrowest reading of the LEC test, the elements uh, are met. Uh, DirecTV Now is an affiliate of AT&T. Direct now, DirecTV Now is uh, offered within the franchise areas. It's offered directly. Uh, and uh, DirecTV Now offers video programming services that are comparable to video programming services offered by Charter. However, uh, as I outlined, I am very concerned with how this straightforward application will impact consumers. The LEC test does not anticipate that in this order to receive the OTT video service, a consumer would have to rely on the service of a competitor to provide an entirely different one and yet necessary service. In this instance, in order for consumers in these markets to receive DirecTV now, of course, they must first purchase the Internet. Assuming an Internet service provider provides you with that satisfactory rate on a suitable Internet service, only then can you purchase one of the several DirecTV offerings, all of which are more expensive than the regulated basic cable service you may have originally had. And this is not the type of competition that I believe uh, was contemplated originally in the LEC rule, which brings me to my core concern. One cannot ignore the very real impact this order will have likely on consumers' pockets. The record is clear, prices are going to go up. The party requesting this finding of effective competition has itself gone on the record that some consumers will see their rates go up by nearly 100%. While the Commission um, uh, refused several requests for additional fact-finding, anecdotal evidence strongly suggests that most Internet subscribers receive their services bundled with their cable services in, in order to receive a cheaper total price for Internet and cable services rather than just receiving Internet service standalone. We do not take up that issue today. Finally, those consumers relying on basic cable service, while they may be few, are often the most underprivileged consumers that we have and often are on fixed incomes. Where some of these consumers were paying just as little as $12 a month for the regulated basic cable services, they may well now have to spend upwards of $100 per month. And that is no small expense to those that are living on a fixed income. These are members of the community who are retired, elderly, veterans, uh, or simply those folks trying to make ends meet. The Commission's goal, our mission, should be to make service more affordable for these consumers, not more expensive. And instead, I fear that the decision risks reinforcing some of the inequities we have between families with resources to pay for these services and those without. Regardless of those concerns uh, and the impact of this item, I do want to thank the Media Bureau for this work and will concur. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. During the previous administration, under Chairman Wheeler's leadership, a bipartisan majority of the FCC adopted a rebuttable presumption that cable operators are subject to effective competition. At the time, 99.7% of homes in the United States had access to multiple multi-video programming distributors, including the two major satellite carriers and at least one cable operator. Subsequently, only franchising authorities in Hawaii and Massachusetts filed certified forms successfully rebutting this presumption. As a result, those franchising authorities are the only ones in the country currently authorized to regulate basic tier cable rates. Four years later, the market for video services has become even more competitive. 
Indeed, 70% of U.S. households now subscribe to at least one streaming service. The success of these services is driven by fierce market competition, and consumers are benefiting from high-quality programming. This year, the leading three streaming services, Netflix, Hulu, and Amazon Prime, earned 184 Emmy nominations. And more services are coming online seemingly every month. In November alone, consumers will get at least two more options as Disney Plus and Apple TV Plus join the ranks of online video distributors. The rise of streaming services is clearly having an impact on traditional video providers. By the end of the last year, for example, 33 million adult Americans had cut the cord altogether. Against this backdrop, it strains credulity to suggest that cable operators are not subject to competition in the video marketplace across the nation. And it is even odder to suggest that, in this vast land of some 330 million people, only consumers in a handful of communities in Massachusetts and Hawaii lack comp competitive choices for video entertainment. With all this in mind, today's order focuses on a discrete question of statutory interpretation. Are charters cable systems in certain Hawaii and Massachusetts communities subject to effective competition under Section 623 of the Communications Act? Well, we answered this question in the affirmative, finding that AT&T TV Now streaming services do indeed meet the local exchange carrier test outlined in Section 623. Now, to be sure, when this statute was enacted in 1996, Congress probably didn't specifically envision the video marketplace that exists today. But it wisely established a flexible, forward-looking test using broad language that could apply to new technologies. And this item thoroughly analyzes the language of the statute, meticulously considers the arguments on both sides, and reaches the correct conclusion, one that is consistent with the statute's plain meaning. And so my thanks extend to the Commission staff that diligently worked through this petition. Uh, from the Media Bureau, Michelle Carey, Holly Sauer, Steve Brockert, Diane Sokolow, Joe Price, and Brendan Murray. And from the Office of General Counsel, Susan Aaron and David Consul. Uh, your work on this item has certainly, if nothing else, earned you a good weekend of binge watching. Uh, with that, we'll move to a vote on the item. Commissioner Riley? Aye. Commissioner Carr? Approve. Commissioner Rosenworcel? Concur. Commissioner Starks? Concur. Uh, the chair votes to approve. The item is adopted with editorial privileges granted as requested. Thanks very much. Uh, Madam Secretary, to item number five we go. Mr. Chairman and Commissioners, the fifth item is entitled Reform of Certain Part 61 Tariff Rules. The item will be presented by the Wireline Competition Bureau, and Chris Monteith, Chief of the Bureau, will give the introduction. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Ms. Monteith, just when you thought you were out, we brought you back in. <laughs> Happy to be here. Mr. Chairman and Commissioners, the Wireline Competition Bureau presents for your consideration an item that would update the Commission's tariffing rules to eliminate decades-old requirements that have been overtaken by technological advances and impose needless regulatory burdens. The item was developed by the Wireline Competition Bureau with input from the Offices of Economics and Analytics and General Counsel. I thank the staff in the Bureau's Pricing Policy Division for their, for their work on this item. In particular, I would like to acknowledge Robin Cohn and Susan Baer, whose dedication and hard work produced the item we offer for your consideration today. Seated with me at the table from the Wireline Competition Bureau are Lisa Hone, Deputy Bureau Chief, Gil Strobel, Division Chief, and Robin Cohn, Assistant Division Chief. Robin will present the item. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. Good morning. The item before you would address tariff filing requirements as part of the Commission's ongoing commitment to modernize its rules and remove unnecessary regulatory burdens. Many of the Commission's rules governing tariff filings were adopted decades ago when paper tariffs were filed at the Commission and interested parties had to visit Commission headquarters to review physical copies of those filings. Not surprisingly, technological advances that allow carriers and interested parties to submit and view information electronically have eliminated the need for certain long-standing tariff rules that were predicated on paper filings and lengthy review periods. The item before you addresses two outdated tariff filing requirements. First, the Commission's prohibition on cross-referencing in tariffs 
which was adopted more than 75 years ago when tariffs were often voluminous and filed in hard copy, which made it difficult to follow cross-references from one tariff to another, including between a carrier's own tariffs and those of its affiliates. Today, by contrast, all carriers are required to file tariffs electronically using the Commission's electronic tariff filing system, making it easy to find a cross-referenced tariff. Second, the Commission's requirement that price cap carriers file certain information known as short-form tariff review plans 90 days before their annual access charge filings ha are effective has also outlived its usefulness. Early submission of this information is no longer necessary in light of the ease of reviewing electronic filings and the decreased complexity of annual access charge filings. If adopted, the rules in this order would amend three of the Commission's tariffing rules to allow carriers to cross-reference their tariffs as well as those of their affiliates and eliminate the requirement that price cap carriers file short-form tariff review plans 90 days before their annual interstate access charge filings are effective. The Bureau recommends adoption of the order and requests editorial privileges extending only to technical and conforming edits. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ms. Cohn, for your presentation. We'll now turn to comments from the bench, beginning with Commissioner O'Reilly. I thank the Chair. I'm going to submit my longer statement, but to say that I certainly support the item, especially since not a single soul raised an objection to it in the record. At the same time, put me down as someone who is open to much broader reforms and comprehensive de-tariffing. The whole concept of tariffing is antiquated, inefficient, generally irrelevant, it helps preserve outdated communication networks at the expense of modern architecture and deployment. I thank the Chair. Thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Carr. Uh, thank you, the Bureau team, for leading on this, helping this modernization, streamlining reform. It has my support. Thanks for your work. Great. Commissioner Rosenworcel. Oh, it's getting repetitive. Thank you to the Bureau for your hard work on what I know is a complex subject. This has my full support. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. And uh, Commissioner Starks. I also will be voting to approve. Thank you for the hard work uh, and for your service. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. In 1887, the Interstate Commerce Act was adopted. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, I, this item has my full support as well, so I will uh, refrain from offering a statement at this time. <laughs> we'll move to a vote. Uh, Commissioner O'Reilly? I. I almost had you there for a second. Yeah. I can tell you. Uh, Commissioner Carr? Approve. Uh, Commissioner Rosenworcel? Approve. Commissioner Starks? Approve. The Chair votes to approve as well. Thanks again for the great work. It has our full support. Uh, Madam Secretary, could you please take us to the last item on today's agenda? Mr. Chairman and Commissioners, the sixth and final item is entitled Improving Public Safety Communications in the 800 Megahertz Band. The item will be presented by the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau. Lisa Folks, Chief of the Bureau, will give the introduction. Thank you, Madam Secretary. And uh, Ms. Folks, whenever you and your team are ready, the floor is yours. Good morning, Chairman Pai, Mr. and Madam Commissioners. Today's item is designed to accelerate the successful conclusion of the Commission's 800 megahertz rebanding initiative. The Commission launched the rebanding program in 2004 to eliminate harmful interference to first responders and other public safety spectrum users in the 800 megahertz band. Now that the vast majority of that work is complete and in light of developments since the program began, it makes sense to streamline certain program requirements that are no longer necessary. The order in six further notice a proposed rulemaking before you today would lower administrative costs and expedite completion of the program while still achieving its goals. I would like to thank my awesome first responder communications team. They really rock. They do the bread and butter of what public safety is all, all about. They worked on this item and they work on spectrum and licensing issues day in and day out every day of the week. I'd also like to thank the Office of General Counsel for their assistance with this item. With me today are David Firth, Deputy Chief of the Public Safety and Homeland Security Bureau, and Michael Wilhelm, Chief of the Bureau's Policy and Licensing Division. Mr. Wilhelm presented the original 800 megahertz report and order at the July 2004 agenda meeting. Well, he's back. <laughs> 
and he will pre be presenting this streamlining lining item today. Good morning, Chairman Pai and commissioners. It was in 2004 that the commission initiated its 800 megahertz to remanding program. And it did it because public safety licensees were receiving serious interference from Sprint and others in the 800 megahertz band. And to eliminate this interference, the commission adopted rules requiring Sprint to move more than 2,000 public safety licensee system away from Sprint's location in the 800 megahertz spectrum. The commission issued the 800 megahertz report and order, which required four things. Uh, first of all, it required Sprint to pay the full cost, whatever it turned out to be, of doing 800 megahertz rebanding. And they're also required to pay the cost of relocating their own systems in the band and uh, clearing spectrum in the 1.9 gigahertz spectrum. Now that was spectrum that the commission awarded Sprint in consideration for Sprint's rebanding efforts. The order included what was called an anti-windfall provision so that Sprint would not realize an unfair economic advantage from rebanding. What it provided was that if Sprint's rebanding costs were less than the cost of uh, a value of the 1.9 gigahertz spectrum that Sprint would have to make a anti-windfall payment to the U.S. Treasury. And to manage this enterprise, uh, the Commission established an independent transition administrator, and it was charged with reviewing expenditures, uh, conducting an annual audit, and uh, overseeing disputes that might arise between Sprint and the licensees. Well, in the end, Sprint did not have to make that on a windfall payment. Its rebanding expenses were considerably greater than the value of the 1.9 gigahertz spectrum. The order you have before you today expedites completion of rebanding contracts between the licensees and Sprint. Now, if there are no cost disputes between Sprint and the licensee, it makes no sense to have the transition administrator review uh, details of the transaction, time slips, and that sort of thing. This eliminates the uh, review process. Now, if there are any uh, ongoing disputes between the licensee and Sprint. Uh, we have an expedited review provision <coughs> in the order to resolve those disputes. The further notice of proposed rulemaking is going to eliminate the provision that the transition administrator conduct an annual audit of Sprint's expenditures. That was necessary when the Commission had to consider the anti-windfall payment, but that no longer is a factor. And for that reason, the expensive and time-consuming audit required the expenditure of time by the Transition Administrator and the Commission uh, is eliminated in the uh, further notice. Now, we can do that safely. Sprint's uh, obligation to complete rebanding is secured by a letter of credit that uh, allows us sufficient funds to have rebanding completed if Sprint, for some reason, were to default. Uh, if this order is approved, it's going to reduce administrative costs it's going to accelerate the program's successful completion. And so we recommend adoption of this item, and we request editorial privileges for technical and conforming edits. 
Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Wilhelm. I pre presented an item in 2004. You're presenting now in 2019. If my math is correct, we look forward to the wrap-up order in 2034 when you present to the <laughs> commission is then constituted. Uh, Commissioner O'Reilly. I just want you to know I'm not going to be here in 2034. <laughs> so good luck, Mr. Wilhelm. Sounds like you're on it. Uh, 14 years, whole industries have risen and fallen in that time period. I'm glad we're getting to that point. I will submit my longer statement and say um, a number of the, the licenses, though, that we are still working through of the 2,107 licenses are on the Mexican border. Uh, and relatedly, we have a consistent uh, and a concurrent fight we're having uh, with our friends on that border regarding 700 megahertz that this commission is involved in, State Department, a number of entities, and we need to we need to address that. We need to get that resolved. And I thank the Bureau for all of their hard work and the Chairman as well for all the work that he's dedicated to that. Uh, and I'll end there. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Carr. Thanks. Uh, thank you to the Public Safety Bureau for your work on this item. Thank you, Michael, for your work on this. Michael is actually my next door neighbor, so I can vouch uh, for him the late nights that he works, whether on this item or otherwise. I don't think there's a night that I don't see him walking up the street coming home. And, uh, any earlier than 8 o'clock. I, I don't take it personal and assume that you're avoiding me so you don't have to interact with me and my kids uh, before bedtime. I assume that you're actually here uh, doing work and I think this is evidence of it. So thanks so much uh, for your service to the agency. Much appreciated. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. Commissioner Rosenworcel. Uh, the 800 megahertz rebanding story is not a short one, but it is my hope now a decade and a half in that with this kind of rulemaking that streamlines our policies, we will be able to effectively bring it to a close. I just want to thank the Bureau for your work on this over all these years. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. And Commissioner Sturtz. Thank you for uh, your work. Thank you for your longstanding service, sir. Uh, I'll vote to approve. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. And I, too, will refrain from a, an oral statement, but I uh, just wanted to express my appreciation to Mr. Wilhelm and the entire team for working on this. Uh, you've been working on this before I even got here. I still have scarred memories of 2007 and 2008 working in the Office of General Counsel on the Washoe County waivers and all the rest of the stuff that came through on the 800 megahertz rebanding. So uh, uh, this item has my full support. And again, I really appreciate the legwork over a long period of time. This kind of dedication only could it be exhibited by a Cowboys fan such as yourself. Uh, with that, we'll turn to a vote. Commissioner O'Reilly? I was beginning to like Mr. Wilhelm. <laughs> that, was for, that was for Chief Fultz benefit. Oh, my benefit. Yeah. Okay. Uh, aye. Commissioner Carr? Uh, I approve. Commissioner Rosenworcel? Approve. Commissioner Starks? Approve. I approve as well. The item is adopted. The editorial privileges granted and requested. Sorry, Lisa. Uh, do any of my colleagues have any announcements? Uh, Commissioner Wright? <laughs> We can auction okay. it off. <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll, go. No. I'll go first uh, and I'll announce go that auction, Team O'Reilly expanded its forces with the birth last week of Rory Kohelet Roth, who came into the world a healthy eight pounds, two ounces, on October 16th at 5 p.m. She's the daughter of our wireline <coughs> advisor, Ariel, and her husband, Yakov, and the three <coughs> older siblings already have welcomed her with open arms. <coughs> Mom and baby are doing great, and we're looking forward to seeing whether the new baby will enjoy a career steeped in tariffs and call <laughs> switching. Wow. Yeah. Uh, that's all I've got. Okay. All right. Uh, Commissioner Carr? Uh, the Karoff is equally excited about a new addition, a little older one, though. Uh, ben Arden. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Has agreed. Uh, <laughs> Although to that point, I have the exact same hairline as my nine-week-old baby, so <laughs> it's fair. Uh, pleased to welcome Ben to the office uh, as acting legal advisor for media issues. He has an extensive uh, experience in the media bureau and on these issues. He was associate chief of the media bureau's video division, uh, and he did that having recently returned to the FCC following a year in Rwanda, where he served as a program specialist for a USAID-funded project uh, that was designed to increase access to justice and enhance the rule of law in Rwanda. He previously held various positions in the Media Bureau before that one year, uh, most recently before that as Deputy Division Chief uh, in the Industry Analysis Division. And he's worked on a wide range of media issues, uh, including the impact of technology and competition on the media marketplace, on broadcast ownership, and other issues. Uh, he joined the agency in 2010, and before that he was a communications attorney at the law firm of Williams Mullen, who graduated from Indiana University, uh, where he was managing editor of the Federal Communications Law Journal. 
and received his undergrad degree from Arizona. And I will not say that it is an upgrade from my prior uh, media advisor, principally because my prior media advisor is still here, <laughs> working inside the building. Uh, and he's doing fantastic work now in the chairman's office. Uh, and we're very happy to see all the work he's doing. And we're glad that uh, Ben has agreed to step up and help us out. So thanks. Thank you. Uh, anybody else? I do, Mr. Chairman. Okay, Commissioner Stites. Yes, uh, thank you. Let me start with the great news. We have uh, the third baby from the Starks offices, Mike okay. Scarato, my acting legal advisor for media. Uh, no, that's, is, is this, is this uh, the Starks, is this Scarato's baby? <laughs> oh, okay, I, I thought I saw another picture. <laughs> too good looking, you can't see. <laughs> this is uh, Jonathan Peter Scarato. <laughs> uh, he was born on Saturday, coming in at six pounds, 14 ounces. Um, uh, both uh, the whole family's doing well. Congratulations to, um, uh, to Mike, to Carmen, uh, and his two sisters there. Uh, while Mike is out on paternity leave, I have been working with Gavin Logan, who's been helping me out. You can go ahead and stand, Gavin. There we go. Uh, Gavin has come to the commission, uh, works in TAPTI, but I have known and worked with Gavin when he was d the director of tech and telecom policy at the National Urban League. Prior to that, he served as the District of Columbia's in interim general counsel and assistant general counsel uh, in the office of cable, television, film, music, and entertainment. Um, and his legal experience includes time at the Office of the uh, Attorney General for DC, the Multicultural Media, Telecom, and Internet Council. Uh, he received his JD from Northeastern University School of Law and a BA in Political Science from Brown. Little fact here, he's a black belt in Chinese Kempo Karate. Get out, wow. <laughs> it's like the opiate scene in The Matrix, right? Where <laughs> <laughs> I like it. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for your help, I Kevin. Negotiate any items with <laughs> <laughs> Finally, uh, and importantly, I have some bittersweet news that my acting legal advisor, Randy Clark, uh, is going to be leaving at the end of next week. Randy, please stand. Randy has done tremendous work. Yes, please. <laughs> Randy has done truly outstanding work. Uh, I am forever indebted to your hard work for your service, truly for the American people. Um, uh, he has many colleagues here. He's a longstanding um, person who is well known here in the FCC circles, also on the Senate. And folks who can testify that there is somebody I would be challenged to find somebody who knows more on the very intricacies uh, of a lot of our rules than Randy. Um, don't make any assumptions about Randy, though. He has some hidden depth as well. He's a drummer in two bands, including the FCC's famous Harmful Interference Band. <laughs> He worked as a ski instructor in Aspen for three years. He sailed a sailboat uh, from Florida to the Bahamas for four months. Wow. He is truly a renaissance man. Uh, you will be missed. We will have a fare thee well, though, uh, for Randy. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Rizzo. I just want to add to Commissioner Starks and say thank you so much, Randy, for your work in these halls and my old stopping ground on Capitol Hill. You're an extraordinary public service, and we really appreciate that the time you've spent here with us. Amen to that uh, from me, and uh, I just want to take a few minutes uh, on my own behalf uh, to introduce, among others, our fall law clerk, Victoria Rendezzo, who I think is here. Uh, sorry, the hazing involves standing up and uh, <laughs> afraid, but Victoria is originally from Poughkeepsie, New York, and she got her undergraduate degree in finance from Marist College in uh, Poughkeepsie. Despite her New York roots, she assures us uh, that she is not a Yankees fan, so we're grateful for that. Uh, that is worth applause, indeed. Uh, she, uh, she is now at 3L at Antonin Scalia Law School at George Mason. We hired her under a bit of a misunderstanding on our part. Uh, we thought she had spent many years working on a beet farm, but it turns out she's simply a fan of Dwight Schrute and The Office. Um, before joining the chairman's office, she was an intern in OEA, where she did a great job, so much so that she apparently wanted to stick around. Uh, her, antitrust, uh, her interests include antitrust and telecom, but her hobbies include drinking coffee, which of course endears, us to, uh, endears her to the office, and searching for the best pizza in the DMV. Good luck with that. Uh, but welcome, Victoria. She's already done a great job and look forward to uh, much more spectacular work in the time to come. 
On a less happy note, I wanted to announce the departure of Gloria Thomas. Uh, those of you who know the FCC, yeah, uh, those of you who know and love the FCC library as I do, will immediately recognize what a contribution uh, Gloria has made over the years. In fact, she is retiring now after 45 years of service to the commission. I don't believe she's here today, but we will certainly convey uh, to her the fact that uh, her service was very much appreci appreciated. She was here with us through thick and thin, thin at 19th and M, all the way to the portals. Uh, no question has been too obscure or no need too urgent uh, for her to come through and meet our information needs. Uh, Gloria, thank you for your service to the commission, to the country. We will miss you and we wish you well in a very well-deserved retirement. Last but not least, uh, today is an anniversary for many. Uh, for those who are celebrating, you might say Happy Diwali. For others, you might say Happy St. Crispin's Day. However, given that we're at the FCC, I would prefer to say happy 25th anniversary to the International Bureau. 25 years ago today, the International Bureau was created. Today, it is ably led by Tom Sullivan and the many dedicated staff of the International Bureau who handle everything from satellite licensing to international negotiations. Uh, having spent a great deal of time with them, especially this past year, I can say that they are fantastic public servants and it's a great example of how the Commission adjusted its mission and how public servants stepped up to deliver value to the American people. Uh, if my colleagues don't have any further announcements, uh, Madam Secretary, could you please announce the date of the next FCC agenda meeting? The next agenda meeting of the Federal Communications Commission is Tuesday, November 19th, 2019. And with that, we are adjourned. <coughs>
any modifications that are made in the D.C. District Court in the Tunyak proceedings, uh, could that influence the FCC's own action on the, uh, on the case? All I can say with respect to timeline uh, is uh, that I can't comment except to say that it is internal processes that are regular and are being worked through. Hi. Nice to see you back in D.C. Likewise. Um, I wanted to follow up on your uh, World Radio uh, Communication Conference um, statement. Uh, are there any agenda items that you find to be particularly pressing, or do you have any um, you know, main spectrum band that you think is critical for um, the U.S. to sort of hammer out international policy on? I think there are several of them uh, where uh, the World Radio Communication Conference is going to be considering items of interest, not just to the United States, but to our entire region. Uh, for example, in particular, I support, the FCC supports, the United States government, of course, supports the inter-American proposal that came out of CTEL with respect to the 24 gigahertz band. Uh, there, as you might have seen, uh, the U.S. government has reached a consensus on the position, and that consensus would allow us to move forward in a way that would advance the ball in terms of 5G development and deployment. Um, I think that spirit of cooperation that we saw at CTEL uh, will hopefully serve uh, as well as an international community. And overall, I think many of the people I've talked to, and in the last several months I've talked to everybody from regulators from you know, Mongolia to Brazil, India to Israel, we are all on the same page in wanting to make sure that uh, we, uh, that the uh, officials from around the world are looking to the future and to free up enough spectrum across these different services to ensure that citizens of all of these countries uh, can benefit from next generation innovation. Hi, um, can you talk about when and how uh, you're going to answer a petition on pausing, whether to pause the lifeline minimum broadband service requirements set to take place in early December and does the recent net neutrality court decision sending back lifeline broadband on remand, does that impact mm. the agency's authority over lifeline broadband? And do you, um, how, do you, how would you address that? Will you, will you send that out for comment, that, that kind of thing? Uh, so with respect to the petitions that you reference, uh, those petitions are under active consideration by the commission. I can't give you a specific time frame, but we are obviously mindful of the December 1st deadline that uh, the previous administration <coughs> set, and so we are uh, going to take action in due course. And the, the issue on remand from net neutrality? Oh, uh, was it how we were going to deal with it? We have it, we we're still just looking at our options in terms of uh, the way forward, both with respect to litigation and administrative any, any process. Any timeline? Sending it out for comment? Nothing. No, no particular timeline, sorry. Hi, Chairman. Hi. Uh, so just going off the order adopted by the Commission about at and streaming service being effective competition, I think it was your blog post earlier this month where you said the FCC's rules should acknowledge how um, IP-based services are changing the video marketplace. Um, and so I'm just wondering, in addition to the order today, are there any other steps you think the FCC should take to acknowledge how um, IP-based services have changed the video marketplace? That's a good question. I can't give you a comprehensive list, but I think it's obvious uh, for anybody who spends time consuming or regulating IP-based services that those services have proliferated and they've dramatically changed the marketplace. So I can't forecast a particular regulatory change that might be on tap or issue that we are considering. But I think across our work, one of the goals of the last two and a half years is to recognize that the marketplace has changed uh, because of these IP-based services and that to, to the extent uh, possible, our regulatory framework should adjust accordingly to make sure that uh, we are not dealing with a marketplace that no longer exists. Uh, Chairman, uh, stipulating that the LEC test is, is statutorily uh, required due to make the decisions that you made today, as you and all the other four commissioners said, at yeah. the same time the two minority commissioners had expressed discomfort with the vote, saying that they wish that uh, price issues could be taken into account with the decision. Philosophically, do you think that the FCC should be able to look at price issues when making decisions like effective competition? Well, that's ultimately a decision for Congress to make. As you saw from the dais, there was a right. uniform. But, uh, but that, I, I guess that's, a, that, but I'm asking you philosophically as opposed to how the structure works. Right. Like, would you like the ability to, to look at price issues? 
Well, certainly we always want to ensure that there's a competitive marketplace. But again, the narrow task that we were entrusted with in Section 623 by Congress over many, many years, and one which the Commission discharged unanimously today, was that from a legal perspective, the effective competition test is set forth by Congress as met. And so I'm always looking forward to working with colleagues on other particular issues. But here again, we are focused on that particular test. And I'm glad we reached a result that was uh, correct under the statute, thanks in part to the great work from our Media Bureau. Thank you. Uh, yeah, just wanted to see if you had any updates on, um, you know, any new thoughts on whether you agree with uh, states that are still asking, you know, the FCC to slow the Lifeline National Verifier rollout and then also are asking the FCC to look at broadening the USF contribution base. Uh, no update other than to say that uh, with respect to the first, uh, as we have made clear, we are always willing to work with states uh, that are looking to establish a connection with us. I'm also proud of the terrific work our Wireline Competition Bureau and other uh, folks did to establish a connection with the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, and that connection, which was established in September, has allowed numerous uh, customers, including some 67 percent of Lifeline eligible customers in New York, to be automatically uh, verified. Manual verification, of course, continues uh, for uh, other customers, and so uh, the door remains open for any states that are looking forward to working with us. But I think the Wireline Competition Bureau's order describes in appropriate and thorough detail uh, the steps that we took in order to enable some of those connections, and uh, I, I can't improve upon what the Bureau said in that order. Good afternoon, Chairman. Uh, do you have any thoughts on the timeline we should be expecting for a decision on Legato's spectrum repurposing? Uh, yes, I have thoughts. <laughs> You've been great. You can share? <laughs> uh, not thoughts that I can share, no. <laughs> no, no time. Chair uh, Pike, two longstanding Sorry, questions, two rulemakings. One on the Uh, so, yeah, no, again, no specific uh, time frame I can offer on uh, the 5.9 gigahertz of proceeding other than to say that I've been working with our terrific team uh, from across several bureaus and offices on the way forward along with other uh, federal partners. So uh, we still hope to make uh, progress on that front. So on the supply chain, what about the supply chain? Oh, uh, yeah, no news to, to break today on that one. All right. Go next. Just, <laughs> and happy Halloween. <laughs> so. All right. Mark Wigfield, you're up Street for the Bureau press conference, about, so take it away. Um, they asked every member of Congress about uh, do they, you know, want the Nats to win and, like, the range of it. Like, they, you know, every set um, okay, I think we'll do all the wireline bureaus together. Um, so are there any questions first on the, um, the uh, I'm sorry, the uh, broadband uh, standards item? Okay, Monica. Um, why don't and are there going to be questions on the uh, VoIP item as well? How about on the tariff item? Okay, so I think we just need the team that worked on the um, broadband standards. Hi. Hi. Um, can you please tell me whether there were modifications? On, on the order, um, I, I don't think there were any specifically addressed today, but w were there any that answered any of the trade group concerns, especially um, on the penalty end of it? Yes, we did, we did respond to ex partes that were filed in the record of this proceeding, and I'm going to let Sue just quickly walk you through them at a high level. Thank you. So th there were a couple of tweaks, but I think substantively, one, we provided greater flexibility to carriers in selecting the subscribers that are subject to testing. Um, secondly, we modified the noncompliance rules to provide credit where carriers can demonstrate compliance for some portion of their term. And then finally, we clarified that we will make the pre-testing data publicly available. And when you said um, you're giving them flexibility in s 
selecting the subscribers, does that mean that they can go back for a second random testing if, if there, there weren't any in the, the higher tier level? Is that? Yeah, so they're first subject to the pool that we provide, and then if they have additional carriers at that service tier that were not part of the initial list, they can go to that list before then upgrading um, additional subscribers. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Can you get those in the side? Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, the next item would be the uh, Media Bureau's antenna item. Are there questions on that one? Okay, and then the next Media Bureau item is the effective uh, a competition. Okay, so Media Bureau. Sure, you don't have like 10 questions about the to a proposal that you regulate World War II rules. <laughs> yeah. If only. This is like a missed opportunity. <laughs> Uh, two questions. First off, any substantive uh, or, or major changes from the draft to what was just approved? Nothing major. Just, just tweaks. Yeah, essence. ex parte, addressing ex partes that came in. Gotcha. Nothing, nothing huge. And then stipulating that the, the, the Bureau can't speak definitively on this, but I guess I'm just wondering, does it have a sense of how likely you believe that there will be legal challenges, especially from Massachusetts or Hawaii on this? We them would being defer the parties to Massachusetts that's... and Hawaii on that question. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, the final item is the public safety item, 800 megahertz. Are there questions on that item? <coughs> All right. Well, thank you. Uh, now the commissioners are here for the press conference. If nobody has had a chance yet to read my 37-minute speech from Mobile World Congress, if you have trouble falling asleep tonight, highly recommend it. I'll get you right there. It's funnier in my mind than how it came out, but <laughs> see if you got a better one. No, uh, no who has time for sleep? Yeah. <laughs> Hi, uh, Matt Tracy, a reporter with a news publication called Reorg uh, here in D.C. I think we met before. Uh, thank you for taking my question. Uh, it has to do with the Sprint T-Mobile uh, order, uh, which was uh, last uh, voted on by Commissioner Starks on October 16th. Uh, there have been several edits made to the order prior to the final vote being cast, and just wanted to get any updates or any details at all on what the nature of those edits were. Uh, I won't comment about the item until it's released. Uh, <coughs> the limitations uh, in the rules on that. I, I'm, I'll just say, and I saw your previous question, we're working diligently on our statement um, we've had, I was just in LA, so that has been a little bit of delay. I, I am maybe a part of the cause, so we're working on, on, I'm working on my statement, and that's been a, a little bit of delay, so we, I'm sure we'll get it out expeditiously. The statement, uh, just uh, uh, explaining your, your decision on, on the matter? Or? Exactly. Okay. Uh, anything you can add on to what uh, Chairman Pai said uh, to my last question about, you know, when we can expect an official version of the order to be released? I have to defer to the Chairman on, on all timing so issues. Okay. On that one. Uh, uh, similarly, uh, position, I think, you know, the process that we run here is the exact same process that the agency uses in all cases. So the document itself uh, that circulated hits the floor to all of us uh, at the same time. I think that was August 4th or 14th, something uh, like that in this case. And then just like every uh, item on circulate or even open meeting item, that's a process then begins where uh, I saw the document for the first time at that point. I assume my colleagues did as well. Uh, and just like every single item, people get to ask for edits or not ask for edits. Uh, and if there's three people supporting it, those get in, and that's the normal course procedure that we run. In terms of where we are right now on process, for my part, it's simply finishing up my separate statement, which again, we do separate statements just like you heard up here on the dais today uh, that'll be attached to the back end of the document, and that's uh, all that uh, I'm working on or my team is working on if they're listening, uh, <laughs> is finishing up that uh, separate statement. And, uh, but in terms of time, that ultimately be the, the chairman's call, but I don't think we're uh, that far at this point. Okay. And uh, just, just one more question for uh, Commissioner O'Reilly. Uh, regarding the Third Circuit Court of Appeals ruling uh, last month on the ownership rule changes made in 2017, um, at the time you put out a statement uh, uh, recommending that uh, you all take it to the uh, Supreme Court. Have there been any, any internal uh, decision-making uh, processes in that regard and any any uh, determinations made? I, uh, not to 
I have to defer to the chairman and his team having conversations with the general counsel's office, I'm sure, but I don't. I haven't had any conversations. I, I'm, I'm supportive of taking it to whatever level to get to a better outcome than we got in the Third Circuit. Great. Thank you. To 11 if we have to, yeah. yeah exactly. Uh, hi, commissioners. I wanted to ask if both of you have um, some commentary on the pricing concerns that Commissioner Rosenworcel and Commissioner Starks raised for the charter <coughs> petition. Um, did the commission find that this petition would definitively raise prices for consumers, or was that outside of the scope of what was considered here? Uh, the item doesn't make any uh, finding on that issue. I think, uh, as I listened to my colleagues, it sounded to me like they had wished that Congress had passed a different statute that had included uh, different considerations. And I think if you go back to uh, first principles, the very first principle in this country, uh, the Constitution, the, the statute went through uh, the Senate, the House, bicameralism, presentment, uh, and actually in a quirk, at least in the first part of it, the 92 Cable Act went back and was a uh, presidential veto overridden. But that's the process through which we go to in this country to make law and outside of uh, lawful delegations to us in a Chevron sense, we apply the law that Congress passes and um, I don't give you my views uh, about whether I wish the statute had said this or said that. My job is to uh, apply it uh, outside those lawful delegations and that's why I think this was just a straightforward case of statutory interpretation and I don't think you heard a lot of disagreement on the dais on, on that matter. Yeah, I, I think he answered your, your question and now I think we understand why it took 37 minutes to give a speech. <laughs> <laughs> there was actually more jokes in that one, which I can tell you again if you guys want to hear about it. Hi. Um, this is for Commissioner O'Reilly. Um, when do you expect to hold the next federal state joint board for universal service and do you have a plan for a federal response to the recommenda recommendation a week or so ago from some state members that um, you should include broadband access in the USF contribution base? Well, I'll take the second one first, and I've talked about this a number of times and made clear I don't support that proposal. <coughs> made clear to them I don't support that proposal. Um, I'm f in favor of, of convening when it will be productive. Um, there are a number of states that have been very committed to a particular proposal that I don't agree with. Um, and, and very few interest or very little interest in considering other ideas. Um, that makes it very difficult to try and find common ground. And I testified to the fact that we're, you know, a number of months ago that we're, uh, you know, a, at a crossroads on this issue, that there's not agreement and I don't know how exactly we can get there when people are stuck to their previous positions. Um, and so I, I look forward to working with uh, st states that are, that are constructive and have new ideas uh, on how best to, to get to a place. Thank you. Uh, question for Commissioner O'Reilly. I know you've uh, previously said you're not bothered by the idea of a private auction when it comes to uh, reallocating parts of the C-band, but I'm just wondering if you have a firm position when it comes to a public versus a private auction. Well, I didn't say, I think I said uh, I'm interested in, in, in producing an outcome that will generate um, licensing in speed is important to me. Um, I haven't endorsed a, a private model, but I've said very good things about it because I think it can be conducive to that purpose. Um, and I, I'm waiting for more specifics from a number of entities and commentary on it. Um, you know, things like how much spectrum we're talking about. I'm not ready to, to you know, endorse or, or favor one proposal until I get some of the, the details. I outlined four specific um, points that were going to be important to me, and I'm waiting for the details on how those play out before I can figure out exactly where to land. Also, a CBAC question for both of you. Do either of you have thoughts on whether there should be a mandated uh, percentage of revenue sharing from satellite operators? Should that be a, a stipulated percentage? Or how should how should revenue sharing be done with, with Treasury? Well, uh, in terms of uh, whether we would do it at the Commission or not, I, I've said that speed is of importance on the, the statute and something I worked cons considerably out uh, on, even in the in a FCC auction mechanism, is not to take revenues and it is not a mechanism to maximize revenues. Um, it is about the, it's always been about the allocation of licenses and how we can get services to the American people. And so that's what I have focused on. Uh, others would like to see some type of structure as you, you outlined and I defer to them on what would be uh, the right landing spot. Mr. Carr, same question. Yeah, I think some of the, that question, obviously we have a, a, a big question that a lot of the people are interested in right now is, you know, is it public auction, is it private auction? I think the question is a fork in the road down here, but without breaking news as to that initial fork, I think um, regardless of whether we go an FCC public auction or a private auction route, 
uh, for me, there has to be uh, money going back uh, to the treasurer, some uh, significant contribution. Again, where that number lies, I'm not ready to sort of get into that uh, at this point, but I do think regardless of which way we go, uh, there needs to be uh, money to the treasurer. And that's the guardrails that I've put out in terms of my own personal vote for a while, which is at least 300 megahertz, some money going back to the treasury, sort of regardless of which way we go. Uh, in some sort of transparent process where people think that there was, you know, a fair bite of the apple here. That was, that was a very good hand. Yeah, sort of yeah, trying to visualize it for you. <laughs> uh, yeah, question for both of you just about um, the continued rollout of the Lifeline National Verifier. Um, states, you know, uh, and, and commissions of, of both uh, parties in states continue to be concerned. Uh, I'm wondering, do you, uh, I guess, continue to support the full rollout of it, you know, by the end of the year? Um, do you think that uh, uh, there are any legitimate concerns, any, anything else uh, in this area? I have nothing more to add on that. I think, you know, the chairman's office and our bureau staff are, are very, very actively engaged on this issue, and I don't want to get uh, outside of the work that, that they're doing on that right now. Well, I support the adoption of a verifier and have. I think it's a, a mechanism to address the waste, fraud, and abuse in the program. Uh, and that's on something that it bipartisanly has been supported over the years at the commission. In terms of the specifics, I, you know, I'm, I, I've been trying to get and, and, and follow uh, those details uh, as they as they uh, as they're available. Um, it's been a little bit more difficult. USAC, I think I've talked about before, has not been most for forthcoming on some of those things. Um, I think I testified recently that, uh, well, last time that we appeared before the Congress, that it was it was hard to get data points on exactly what was happening um, in the states in terms of the uh, the, the readoption rates or the re-improvement rates. And, uh, so I, I'm trying to find some of the data points, uh, and then we'll make a decision as, as we go forward. Uh, um, just regarding USAC, I know you've you know had concerns about their composition and, and processes and other things there. Could you just, I guess, reiterate what concerns do you have about USAC and them not making uh, data how available? How much time do you have? <laughs> you have well, 37 minutes? May, maybe, in, <laughs> <laughs> maybe in three minutes. Well, I won't even take that long. I, I articulated both substantive and process issues with USAC, and I'd like to see it changed. Um, notwithstanding all of that and, and recommendations I've made for improving the process, um, I, I've been just trying to get data points on the particulars and to see how they match up with my conversations with providers in certain states to see if the re-enrollment rates, uh, which is the term I should have used before, the re-enrollment rates are, are, are consistent. They seem to be differing, um, and the, the facts on the ground from, from states and providers seem to not match up with some of ours. And I, so I've been just trying to, to, to understand that uh, fully uh, as we go forward. Uh, going back to C-band, is your favorite topic at this point? Is mine. <laughs> and uh, and uh, revenue sharing with the Treasury. Has the CBA offered a percentage? Is there a bid ask between what they're offering and what maybe you see as an appropriate amount? Uh, I'm not aware of, of a specific bid ask process between uh, the FCC uh, and CBA at this point. Uh, the chairman's office may be more uh, in the weeds, maybe not on that issue. Um, but I do think it's important that a, a significant uh, contribution be made, at least uh, in terms of where I am in terms of support, and I don't think there's been uh, an agreement that I'm aware of, of, of whether that's a particular percentage, whether it's a particular number, again, assuming uh, that that was going down the route. Of course, if we go down the other route, the, uh, the percentage uh, number is uh, set and determined just by uh, the operation of the statute. So. Um, I, I'm not party to any conversation on that point. It hasn't been my sticking uh, point on the overall process, so I, I, I just haven't been party to it. Thank you. Can, can I just ask, do either one of you have a, a thought about how you should respond to the Restoring Our Freedom Order remand? Should you, uh, should you guys appeal to the full D.C. Circuit, or should you address <coughs> the administration? Uh, I don't think I've had any sort of inside deliberations with the Chairman's Office or General Counsel about uh, next steps in that, either in terms of, you know, is there uh, uh, an order on remand out of us? Is there an appeal up? <clears throat> How does all that work? Um, I haven't engaged in the in-depth inside discussions on that, so no thoughts really to share. I do just, uh, you know, think that it's I'm glad that the, the main key issue, Title II, Title I, uh, has been decided. And I think on the state issues, the court was clear, effectively speaking to maybe roughly translating into a field preemption uh, concern, but uh, plainly making it very clear that 
the state efforts under the guise of net neutrality are not blessed by the D.C. Circuit decision. I think that's plain from a straightforward reading of it, even though there's been some spin contrary to that. It will be essentially a conflict preemption analysis that uh, may have to run uh, at this point. So I think that's where we are. Yeah, I'd have to defer to the chairman and his team. I don't think those conversations are occurring <coughs> in terms of recommendations on which, which activity to go. I'm, you know, pleasantly pleased with the, how the item came out by the court. There, obviously, I had deep disagreements uh, on their approach on, on preemption. I've talked about why, the, you know, why we need to proactively address preemptive uh, activities. Um, it didn't, I didn't win the day in the short term. Uh, I don't think that's going to be the last moment to talk about that issue, though. <laughs> yes, rooting for Patrick Mahomes' dislocated knee to get better. Um, just me today, y'all. So let's do it. Uh, yes, hi, uh, Matthew Tracy. Um, I'm a reporter based here in D.C. with a news publication called Reorg that covers mergers and acquisitions. Uh, you can probably guess I'm asking about the Sprint T-Mobile order. Um, there were media reports on the day that you cast your vote, the final vote uh, among the commissioners on October 16th, uh, that uh, Chairman Pai's office were making final edits to it before you had a chance to review and, and vote on the, on the, on the, uh, on the order. Um, can you uh, say anything about the nature of those edits and uh, just your thoughts about having to uh, make a decision, you know, at the last minute like that um, on, on, a, on a final uh, edited version of the order? Yes. Well, uh, you know, I'm not going to get into um what the chairman's office uh, was working on. Uh, I was waiting for the final, um, 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 for it to be finalized from the chairman's office before I made my vote. Uh, I had reviewed the record, uh, reviewed the recommendations by the team, and I had made my decisions. I was waiting for the document to be finalized from the chairman before I cast my vote, though. Okay. Thank you. Hi, Commissioner. Um, I wanted to see if you could just comment a little bit further on this um, charter petition for effective competition and what you would like to see as a price analysis, um, since both you and Commissioner Rosenworcel sort of lamented the fact that that wasn't included this time around, even if it was potentially outside of the scope of the narrow petition. Yeah, so, I mean, there were uh, uh, findings in the record uh, that right now the basic serv cable service plan is $12. Their nationwide rate is going to be $24. So that's where, um, you know, the 100% markup uh, is coming from, and that is part of the record. Um, but I think you heard universally from the dais that, um, um, you know, a strict, narrow ruling is what even I agreed to. Uh, but including that we are, uh, as ever, I think about who are the consumers that we most need to protect. And, and lots of these folks, as I mentioned, are veterans, are elderly folks, the most vulnerable in a lot of instances. Uh, and making sure that we're thinking through um, a policy as well that includes how it's going to affect those consumers. Hi. Um, Hi. Last week at the Shelby Anchor Nets conference, you mentioned that you want to find a, a way to si sign up more folks who enter homeless shelters for uh, lifeline uh -huh. service and, and phone. Can, can you expand a little bit about what that would look like in practice? Would the providers have to work with uh, social service uh, agents in, inside the facilities? And can you speak also to whether the national verifier program that's um, being implemented would be a, a help or a hindrance to that kind of thing? Well, on the second question first, um, you know, obviously as a form, as a, um, a Department of Justice lawyer, as a, even somebody who in the FCC here, FCC here in the Enforcement Bureau, uh, I, I'm somebody who believes that we do have to have secure programs that don't have waste, fraud, and abuse. Mm -hmm. um, I am troubled that the verifier is having so much implementation problems. Uh, and I've consistently said that um, Lifeline is obviously for the most vulnerable population that we have. 
Uh, and so not, ha not being able to have a program that is effective and effectuates um, uh, the mission and the goal to get phones for um, uh, in folks' hands f so that they can get a job. Literally, you go talk to people. What's the first thing when you're applying for a job? People ask, how do we get in touch with you? That's why we have Lifeline phones, for people to co stay connected to their loved ones, uh, for folks to, uh, for jobs, medical care. In terms of your, the first part of your question, I have visited a number of homeless, shel homeless shelters. Uh, uh, Miriam's Kitchen here in DC. Uh, in San Francisco, I have visited um, um, uh, the Tenderloin Tech Center. Um, what was the name of the youth center, Randy? Larkin Street. Larkin Street uh, Youth Center that, uh, for, for homeless youth there in San Francisco. And the point that I was making at Shelby is, uh, obviously when you're talking about vulnerable um, communities like that, the homeless, you know, those, when folks walk through the door, we should make sure that they get what they need, whether that's a, a warm meal, um, um, you know, uh, a fresh shower, uh, warming up, whatever the case may be. <laughs> but we should also be uh, making sure that they know about. And so whenever I go meet with homeless shelters or folks in civic institutions that are working with the homeless and the most vulnerable, making sure that they know about Lifeline program. And so I think it should be part of the, the, the suite uh, of providing folks with a way to help empower them uh, and their lives, and so uh, working with uh, social workers, working to make sure that folks that are in homeless shelters know about the Lifeline program. Obviously, if you're coming to a homeless shelter, you are, in fact, um, somebody who uh, I believe would be eligible for a Lifeline phone. Uh, it, and would you need a, a current address for, to uh, interface it, with the National Verifier program? You know, um, because uh, we do know that a lot of folks, even when I was working uh, and helping folks in Miriam's Kitchen, some folks do put the homeless shelter as their address, and that can be um, uh, part of the uh, part of the issue in actually getting them through. But um, I don't think uh, you, you know part of, part of the issue is making sure that we get these phones to the most vulnerable as quickly as possible. Thank you. Hi, Commissioner. Yep. Um, so regarding the latest notice of inquiry on uh, broadband deployment, you and Commissioner Rosenworcel both issued pretty strong statements against the approach uh, being used for the NOI. Uh -huh. I mean, Commissioner Rosenworcel called for adopting a, a, fa a faster broadband standard and rethinking standards for upload speeds. I'm just wondering um, if you agree that the commission should adopt a faster broadband standard. Um, she wants 100? 100. 100 megabits per second uh -huh. for their uh, download. Uh, you know, I, 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 I haven't thought about that in particular. Uh, obviously, 25.3 is, is the standard that we have set uh, in a lot of places. Um, I, I think the, the bigger point uh, as well um, uh, is making sure that we are getting broadband everywhere. Uh, it really is that critical. I visited Gallup Police, uh, Ohio, uh, just last week where I met with folks. I met with folks there, there at the library, and we see libraries are working a lot um, to help meet people where they are. Um, Frequently in some of these very remote areas, it's the only anchor institution that is getting high-speed internet, and so Wi-Fi hotspots and um, folks are uh, applying for jobs from libraries, and, and and that's the issue that I'm really kind of focused on. Commissioner Hyde, you had some ex parte uh, conversations with Massachusetts about the Charter Effective Competition petition. I guess I'm wondering, do you have an educated guess or sense as to whether there will be litigation appealing this? Do you, have, do you have any kind of insight? Uh, I, I have no uh, insight knowledge on that, um, but I do know, uh, and obviously we got a, a, um, uh, a letter from Senator Markey as well, um, and I know that Hawaii has also been active as well. Uh, I would, I don't want to venture a guess, but I, um, as ever, if folks feel that they need to take it to court to vindicate their interests, um, they will do so. Yeah, I guess, uh, I guess just to follow up, you know, on the national verifier problems, um, do you uh, have concern with the FCC uh, decisions recently not to slow the national verifier rollout? Are you concerned that, um, you know, the FCC is on track to mandate all states use it for new customers and then also confirming current customers by the end of the year? Uh, you know, the issues that I've been aware of, particularly with the verifier, are, um, uh, you know, the electronic databases being synced up. 
uh, the manual review process has a number of folks that um, aren't able to get ported into the program because of that. Um, and, and again, the most important part is that we are, it is essential that we get phones as quickly as possible for folks that are eligible uh, into uh, get them onboarded onto the program and that's what I'm very focused on. Uh, obviously, uh, again, this comes back to a number of issues um, with Sprint uh, as well, uh, hearing that they have, and I think I pointed this out last month, um, um, 40,000 ineligibles is the largest case to date that we have uh, in Lifeline. We're talking here about 850,000, so it is orders and orders of magnitude the alleged largest violation of the Lifeline program, and that's something that I'm focused on too. Yeah, no, I understood and recall those comments. I mean, is that to say, you know, you're not as concerned about the um, the, the national verifier requirement? No. I, I'm concerned about the national verifier and making that is obviously an, an integral part of uh, our lifeline program right now making sure that it works so that we can get phones in the hands of vulnerable people vulnerable people uh, is a priority good afternoon commissioner um, in regards to C band uh, public versus private percent proceeds to Treasury could you just weigh in uh, yeah, I addressed this last month as well, where I said that I have um, concerns with the private auction. Uh, that's where I am still today. A lot of this is swirling around. We don't have final proposals, certainly from uh, the chairman yet, um, yeah, and, and from a number of parties. We're still looking to hear from them. But uh, that's what I said last month, and that's where I'm still today. Good deal. Oh. That's a question for the chairman. Um, you know, but but I would say um, that that is an investigation that um, um, folks should be paying attention to uh, when you're talking about something that is, uh, like I said, orders of magnitude, the largest lifeline investigation. It's something that uh, the chairman's office sh should be focused in resolving it in the right way. Thank you.